And then I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody until we get to talking. All right. So um, can I get a, um, let me see here, what do I want to go through? Can I get someone to read verses 1 through 16 of chapter 26, verses 1 through 16? Any volunteers? Nancy? And then Cheryl, you'll do the next set? Okay. Yeah, Nancy, go ahead and unmute yourself, please. Hi, Carol. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to the disciples, as you know, the Passover is two days away and the son of man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the place of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way and kill him. But not during the feast, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of a very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. I tell you the truth, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then one of the 12, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, what are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 silver coins. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Okay, thank you. So we're getting the, the, the start of our little drama here uh, of Jesus' way to the cross. And of course, we've had on the trip to Jerusalem, we've had three opportunities for him to basically tell the disciples what's going to happen to him. Um, and, and, and this really, you know, answers the question for us, did Jesus know what was going on? Uh, yeah, absolutely. He knew what was ahead. He knew what his part in it was in it. Um, none of this took him by surprise. Um, Jesus was very well aware of what was going on. And in fact, it was his plan. It was God's plan uh, that he was living out. And so this falls a, a lot in line uh, with both the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of John, the fact that Jesus was aware of his mission at this point and was aware of what was going to happen to him. Um, and so he tells them, uh, you know, the Passover's coming, and he's, of course, referred to himself as the Son of Man before, and says, uh, I'll be handed over to be crucified. Now, that would probably shock the disciples at this point, because Crucifixion was really reserved for only the most really heinous of criminals. Um, you know, those who, in fact, crucifixion was not a method of death that was used by the Jewish courts. It was used only by the Romans. So he's kind of uh, pre-telling them the fact that he's not really, even though they will be the catalyst, he's not going to be put to death by the Jewish courts. He's going to be put, put, put to death by the Roman Empire. Uh, because it will result in crucifixion. And, um, you know, so they have to be kind of a little stunned by this because they've been, you know, walking with this guy through his entire mission and they've never seen any kind of seditiousness or any kind of, you know, call to rise up arms against Rome or anything like that. Um, he's just been talking about turning back to God and having a relationship with God. And so um, they've got to be a little stunned about what might be coming. but. Um, you know, Jesus has kind of embarrassed the religious authorities in the last verses leading up to this chapter with some of his questions and some of his condemnations of them by their own words and the things that they said they've done. So they're a little angry at Jesus. And so they decide to uh, gather in the palace of the high priest uh, who's named Caiaphas. 
Now this in itself is kind of odd. Um, if you know anything about the, the religious uh, authorities in the Jewish area in that time, uh, they were forbidden to meet at night. They would not have met at night really under any but the most emergency of circumstances. Once the sun went down, that was the end of the day and they were forbidden from really meeting uh, to discuss business till the sun rose again. And so to have them meet under the cover of night in the palace of the high priest was really quite unusual. It, it really kind of uh, signifies how much these religious authorities were willing to get out of their own rules and out of their own comfort zone in order to take care of this Jesus of Nazareth. So um, he, he really got a burr under their saddle when you kind of see the way that they're reacting to this going to such extraordinary measures. And um, they're also really worried about the upcoming, um, the upcoming festival, which of course is the festival of, Pentecost, of uh, Passover, which is one of the preeminent holidays in, in the Jewish calendar is uh, of course alludes back to um, Exodus and their time in Egypt when uh, they painted the lintels of their door with blood and the, um, you know, the pestilence passed over them, the, the thing that killed all the males in Egypt passed over those that had that on the door. So they looked at that as a great sign of Jesus saving grace. And that was a, a high holy day. The only problem is with that high holy day came throngs of crowds from outside of Jerusalem into Jerusalem. A lot of them would make an annual trek to Jerusalem for the Passover meal, mainly to get families together because families lived in different regions. Um, and so they, they all come together to Jerusalem to try to do this, uh, to try to do this Passover feast. And it's a very holy time, not a time that you would ascribe to trying people or executing people or doing things like that. Uh, usually the, the Passover part of it was, was the big focus. But the problem when you get a big group of people, as we've seen on the news lately, it's hard to control large groups of people. And almost always when this happened in Jerusalem, riots would indeed break out by some of the more seditious um, fringe groups of the Jews, particularly the zealots, uh, as they were called, who, who were called to try to work to overthrow the Roman hold on Jerusalem and free Jerusalem from the Roman Empire. And so um, they're really fearful about this because the last couple of times this has happened, uh, the Romans have kind of responded by killing just thousands of people indiscriminately. Uh, they would just go into the, the, the towns and mow them down. And it was kind of a, kind of a lesson to you to, um, to not riot like that. And, and you know, because how, how these Roman emperors like Pilate, how they were judged by the emperor was by how well they held peace in their territory and did the tax collections. And so rioting and, and looting and revolution uh, were not good for your report card when it got back to the main emperor. And so Pilate was really, and, and I think we talked about this before, before we split, um, Jerusalem was like Pilate's fourth chance. Um, he had had a number of other areas that he was in charge of that did not go well. And so finally they stuck him in Jerusalem, uh, which most of the Romans looked at not very highly uh, because, of, because of the Jewish people there. And so um, Pilate, this was kind of his last stand. If he failed here, he was probably going to end up on a slave ship someplace or executed. So uh, things were not going to go well for him if things got out of hand in Jerusalem. And he's made that known to the high priest. He's made it known to the high priest that if these kind of things go on, you're going to pay a price, a heavy price, and you're going to pay it in blood. And we're going to see that that term of paying with blood is, is really kind of a common theme uh, through this chapter, which will culminate in Jesus paying through his blood on the cross for our forgiveness. And so that's a common theme here. Um, but we have this really kind of uh, poignant uh, episode kind of in the middle of all this that uh, Jesus goes to this house in Bethany and in Matthew, um, it's called the house of Simon the leper. Um, I believe in one of the other gospels, it's um, the home of Lazarus with Mary and Martha. And one of them are the ones that put the ointment, you know, on Jesus. So we get these different tellings, but it's really kind of the same thing. Uh, this woman comes and, and pours uh, some say perfume, some say ointment. 
Um, it, you know, but it's it, it's a really expensive uh, balm from what we get uh, from all the notes that we do this. And, you know, she pours it on Jesus' head, which is something that would have been done as a preparation for burial. So she kind of sees in Jesus that his time has come short. And of course, um, the disciples who are always worried about money more than anything else kind of uh, push back against this woman and say, you know, why are you wasting this on, on, on him when we could be, you know, selling it for, to, for the poor for money, which of course we know from the other gospels that um, it's mentioned that Judas often stole money from the common purse uh, for his own good. So uh, Judas was a bit of a rapscallion when it came to money. And he would rather that money have gone into his purse than on Jesus' head. So we can see where his mind is already, even before he betrays Jesus. Um, but Jesus makes it very clear. You know, he tells them that, you know, he, he tries to hide under, under the thing of we could give it to the poor. But Jesus says, look, the poor are going to be here long after I'm gone. You'll have plenty of time to take care of the poor. I'm only with you for a little while longer. So it's really Jesus kind of telling his followers that, that his journey is almost done. That what he's been talking about all on the journey to Jerusalem and what his what the eventuality of his being on earth is going to be real close. And and uh, by the way, just so you'll know, geography wise, Bethany is a little town about 12 miles outside of Jerusalem. Um, uh, you would walk through um, the Mount of Olives and everything, and Bethany was kind of on the outside. It was uh, the the name itself kind of translate at, translates as the city of the poor. Um, so it was kind of really kind of a, maybe a ghetto, maybe of Jerusalem would be a term we might use, uh, these days where all the lepers and those that were ill and stuff would have been kind of, kind of stayed on the outcast of the city. And of course, that's the people that Jesus goes to because they need his help the most. And that's why he's at Bethany in this night. And so we get, um, that Judas is quite angry at being rebuked by Jesus uh, quite angry at having this gift that could have brought a lot of money to his purse, um, wasted by pouring it on Jesus' head. And so Judas in his peak um, kind of goes to the chief priest and says, hey, what's in it for me if I betray him? If I hand you Jesus and tell you where he is, what can I get out of it? Hmm. This guy that had walked with Jesus for all this time and this is how the relationship goes. And so for a mere 30 pieces of silver, which was basically a slave's day wage um, back in that time, uh, they threw it at him. And from that moment, Judas looked for a way to betray Jesus. So now by really even Jesus saying what he said with the ointment being put over his head, he started into play what's going to happen in the coming days. He started it by, by getting Judas, you know, uh, kind of angered at him and, and moved against him. And from a lot of counts, um, you heard me talk about uh, zealots. Judas was indeed a zealot. He was one of those that thought, that thought that Jesus was here to, really here to be that warrior Messiah, that he was gonna take up an army as King David had done to um, fight against the Romans. And Judas has now finally come to terms with the fact that that's not who Jesus is at all. That Jesus is not here to fight a campaign against the Romans. He's not here to overthrow and take over Jerusalem from the Romans. Um, he's here for some strange reason to die, and Judas doesn't understand that. Uh, probably the other disciples don't either, but it really gets um, Judas upset because he'll, his whole plans were for this big um, insurrection against the Romans, and he's seeing now that it's not going to happen. So he's kind of got given up, for lack of a better term, on Jesus, and figures, well, if he thinks he's going to die anyway, I might as well get something out of it. So, um, I, I, you know, I'll tell them where they are and, and, and get paid for, for turning them over. Um, there are some that believe that, you know, um, Judas also felt that the Romans were kind of closing in on Jesus, and he thought maybe the high priest were the safer bet because it was really rare for them to kill anybody. Um, you know, they would, they would punish people by stoning and things like that, but never to the point of death, more to teach him a lesson. And so there is a thought that maybe Judas, Judas was in a hurry to turn Jesus over almost as a form of protection 
uh, thinking that he would have been safer in the hands of the Jewish authorities than he would have in the Roman authorities, because he knew they would very easily have killed Jesus and crucified him. Um, as it turned out, it really didn't matter because what was going to happen was going to happen. Um, and Judas just did his part about moving the pageant forward. Um, so when Matthew begins again on chapter 26, um, we're up in the upper room. We're, we're starting to make plans for the Passover meal. And um, a quick note on this real quickly, uh, because it's different for some of the, uh, some of the different um, gospels. And that's the question of whether Jesus died on the night before Passover, or rather Jesus died on Passover. And um, Matthew and Luke are kind of of the mind that he actually kind of died on Passover day, where John is of the mind that he died on that evening, or that he was captured on that evening. So there is a little discrepancy between the authors on, you know, the exact timing of whether this is Thursday night or Friday night, but um, we always take this to mean Thursday night, Maundy Thursday, um, which is the night up in the upper room and the night of the foot washing, even though that is not in Matthew's gospel. So um, could I get someone, and Cheryl, I think you had volunteered to read next, uh, to read verses number 26 through 35, 26 through 35. 26, okay. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I shall not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter declared to him, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you, this very night before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. All righty. So um, we get one of the most important parts of the gospel or any gospel for us, and that is uh, this institution or beginning of the Lord's Supper, of the memorial meal that Jesus set forward among his disciples as a way to remember him when he was gone. It was a way to have him present at their table. Um, and we do the same. We do the same at the altar on Sunday, and that's when Jesus becomes present to us. When we uh, do these words of institution and call on the Holy Spirit to descend upon us, and uh, Jesus comes with that Holy Spirit. So this is really an important part to us as a Eucharistic church, is this institution of the bread and wine. And so, you know, we get the, the, the common thing, and and just so we know, this wasn't really anything out of the ordinary other than the circumstances in which it took place. We have plenty of stories where Jesus blessed bread and broke it and blessed wine and they drank it. I mean, Jesus was real big on fellowship. He was always in fellowship with his disciples and with other people that he met. So what he's doing is really a normal course for him. Um, just, just to let you know that the bread and the wine wasn't something unusual that Jesus did just on this night it would have been bread and wine that they would have had probably prepared for the Passover. And, and so, you know, as a fellowship thing coming together this night before is part of what their dinner would have been. And so um, as, as Jesus has talked to them, he takes the bread and the wine, which were actually very common in those days, and which is why he used them as the elements so that, you know, he could have said, I'm, I'm going to take this Russian caviar and this, you know, Dom Perignon uh, 62, which would have been hard for them to find. And then when would they ever do the memorial meal? You know, so Jesus knew that the people he was setting this up for 
were going to be people that would have common things at the table, like drinking wine and bread. I mean, wine was just a beverage to them. It's not kind of our society thinks about wine. It would be like a goblet of water um, for them at a meal. So, um, so he, he takes the bread and breaks it, signifying to us and to them they will remember later as his own brokenness on the cross, what's ahead, that his body will be broken uh, by the Roman centurions. And he says, take, eat, this is my body. Now this would have been really weird for the disciples. It really would have. It would have bordered on cannibalism for them to think, wait a minute, eat your body? What? <laughs> Why not say, take, eat this bread? Or, you know, <laughs> what do you mean, take, eat this, my body? And so um, this probably would have uh, piqued their interest a little, but I think much more than, than Matthew writes about here. But um, I think there probably would have been some questions about that. But then immediately he takes the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, uh, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And remember what a covenant is. All through the New Testament, or the Old Testament, we've had covenant relationship with God and his people, right? God would make covenants. And what is a covenant, and how is it different from like a contract or a regular agreement? Anybody know? When you go into a lawyer and you make an agreement with another person, what's one of the presumptions when you're making that agreement? That you're both kind of coming from equal power, right? That there's an equality across the table. You both get an opportunity to say what you want to say, get it put in the agreement. And so whatever you agree on is kind of agreed on mutually. Well, the thing with the covenant with God is we're obviously not coming to God from a point of equality of power. So a covenant is different in that, yes, it's an agreement between two people, but it's an agreement where one of the parties has greater power over the other one and basically relinquishes that power to make them equal parties in the agreement. It would be like, you know, somebody, you know, giving up some of their money or something to, to make an agreement work. And so, you know, our earliest covenant, of course, is God with Abraham when he makes the covenant with him for, you know, the future generations of Israel. And then he makes a covenant with Noah, you know, I'll never again will um, floodwaters take away humanity and the sign of my covenant will be the rainbow. Um, you know, God, God makes those kind of covenants with us. We don't bargain with God. We have no power to tell God what to do. His covenant is a covenant out of love, but it is a promise. It's like a, a legal agreement. It's a promise for him to do something because of his love for us. And so now we have Jesus saying there's a new covenant. Yes, you have the covenant of Abraham. Yes, you have the covenant of Noah and all the other covenants that God has made. But I'm giving you a new covenant, which is going to go all the way back to Adam and forgive humanity for their sins. And this bread and this wine, this body and blood of mine, are going to be signs of that covenant. Notice the one in this covenant that has all the power is the one that's giving everything up. What are the disciples giving up in this agreement? Nothing, except to follow Jesus' word. But Jesus is giving his very body and blood in order for this covenant to work, okay? And that's how a covenant relationship is different than just like a handshake or a legal argument, okay? That there's, a, there's kind of the powerful one giving where you think actually it would be the weaker one that would have to give to appease the powerful, but we get kind of a different relationship when we talk about covenant with God. And so um, then we have this really unfortunate little tale of Jesus saying to the disciples kind of uh, forthright, hey, you guys are all gonna desert me tonight when I get arrested, they're gonna come and take me away. And you guys are gonna flee into the night like a bunch of rats off a ship. And uh, you know, you're gonna be hard to find again. And of course, Peter, whose mouth is only as big as his foot, um, says, no, Jesus, not me. I'll never, never desert you. Why, even if I have to die, I won't desert you. And Jesus says, Simon Peter, actually tonight before the crow crows twice, you're going to have denied me three times. And uh, Peter just can't believe it. In fact, all the other disciples said the same. So said all the other disciples, oh no, Lord, 
we'll never, we'll never desert you. We'll never run away from you. But it happens. And it happens to the disciples in this thing. They fear for their lives. They fear for their families. Um, they fear for Jesus and they fear getting to know him. We'll have later on the, um, uh, the, the little uh, part where, uh, you know, the woman in the courtyard with Peter, where she says, you know, weren't you one of them? And, and it's the actual denial of Peter where, you know, they're trying to tie these folks in with the ones that they found, you know, out, out in the, uh, out in the garden with Jesus because, you know, now Jesus is going to be tried on a pretty high crime and these guys are really going to be um, accomplices uh, to what Jesus has been doing and to what he said because they have believed him instead of falling away from him. And so the disciples are really in fear of their life. So once again, Jesus is having a hard time getting them to see the big picture and getting them to really believe what it is that he's preaching. Because rather than having faith in him and having faith in his word, they're kind of giving up that, um, you know, their leader. And uh, there's this really kind of beautiful verse in there uh, that Jesus says, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And that's exactly what happens once the shepherd is attacked, where the sheep can no longer hear his voice. They become agitated and scared and they run off, um, often into more danger than protection, uh, as we will find out. So Jesus is kind of setting the disciples up for a bad evening in Jerusalem. Um, yeah, things are about to get a little worse. So, But as he always did in big moments of his life, and we get this particularly in Luke, in Luke um, Jesus prays and he prays and he prays and he prays to God at big moments to kind of concrete and confirm his relationship with God the Father. And we have no difference here in the next set of verses um, with Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. So um, can I get someone to read uh, 36 through 46 for me? Melinda, if you'd unmute yourself and read that, please. Uh, 36 through 46. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began, to, and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, So, could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away for the second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So, leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hand, hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See. My betrayer is at hand. Okay, thank you. And so um, we get these verses that, you know, um, once we, again, we said that Jesus always prayed very heavily um, at, at major crossroads in his life. And this time he takes um, Peter and James and John uh, with him into the garden. And of course, uh, this isn't unusual for us because it was Peter and James and John that went up to the mountain of transfiguration with him. And uh, they have kind of become his closest confidants and his closest disciples, which isn't unusual because they were three of the first four disciples. So they've been with him the longest. So they kind of have that, that kind of a, a gravitas. But, um, you know, so he tells the rest of them to sit there and he takes Peter and James and John with him. And they say he began to be grieved and agitated, uh, which is not a, a, usual, um, a usual emotion that we see for Jesus. Um, certainly grief, uh, you know, we saw the, 
him weeping at Lazarus and weeping for the, uh, you know, the little girl that whose mother came for him and stuff. But agitated is not something we normally think of with Jesus. Um, and so we kind of wonder what's going on here, because as we said, um, Jesus knew what was going on. He knew what was ahead. And obviously in these words, he knows the plan because he's ask, asking his father, you know, if it's possible, don't let this happen. Um, not that they're separate things though, but we're, we're really kind of getting a taste of the humanity of Jesus here. Um, so much in Matthew, we see the divinity of Jesus, but here we really see the humanity. We see his human side as any human would do facing uh, possibly certain death or imprisonment, um, being agitated and being possibly a little frightened and, you know, not wanting it to happen. And, and certainly we get on our knees and pray to God uh, to make things pass us. <laughs> um, you know, certain bad things that might befall us. We pray for God to protect us. And, um, you know, Jesus is doing the same thing here. And um, he asked the disciples to stay awake with me. And that's kind of an interesting verbiage. Um, you know, he takes them into the woods. He kind of walks away from them and says, stay awake. Uh, we don't know if that means to kind of guard him so that uh, they can say something if someone's coming up to arrest him because he knows he'll be arrested. Um, I'm wondering if maybe translation, he was asking them to pray with them. You know, stay awake and pray with me, which is what we do on Easter Vigil, right? When we, when we, or we used to stay awake <laughs> through the night and pray the vigil, you know, we stay awake with Jesus for an hour, uh, not just to pray for ourselves, but to pray for and with him. And I think that's what he's asking for here. And so he comes back and he finds them sleeping and he, you know, he, he has to wake them up again and say, come on, wake up. And then he tells, you know, Peter, could you not stay awake with me one hour? So already Peter's kind of deserting him, right? He's not doing what Jesus has asked him to do, uh, to stay awake. But then we see a little twist here. Rather than asking Peter to stay to pray for him, Jesus says, says, stay awake and pray that you might not come into the time of trial. Jesus doesn't say pray that I don't come into the time of trial. He's now telling the disciples to pray for themselves because he knows their road's going to be a little rocky too. And so, you know, he says the spirit is willing. You guys are real easy to say you'll do this but the flesh, the actually doing it is a little weak. And so he leaves them with that. And so again, he goes away for the second time and prays and asks again, you know, God, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Or in other versions we get, you know, let this cup pass from my lips. Um, there's a number of different ways that it's been translated, but um, he's basically saying, you know, and, and the wine is the key thing here, you know, this cup. This cup of wine, which is signifying of what? His blood, right? So he knows the blood is going to be spilled. And that's what he's asking God here. He's asking him, you know, if we can do this without bloodshed, um, let it be so. But if not, let it be your will. And then so he goes back again. And, of course, they're sleeping again. And, um, you know, he, he's really kind of agitated with them again. And so he goes and prays for the third time. And still, they're sleeping and taking their rest. He just can't get them to, to stay awake with them while he prays. And so, finally, though, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. And he says to them, get up, let us be going. My betrayer is at hand. And so, before we get into that section, I'd like to take just a moment, and let's kind of talk about uh, these little uh, passages of Jesus in the garden with his disciples and Jesus in the upper room and see what kind of questions, comments, feelings, whatever you guys might have about this. So um, I'm going to, um, I'll tell you what, uh, if we could, it seemed to work better if we raise our hands and people unmute themselves uh, when they do that. So who has something like to like to add or bring up about what we've read? Anything maybe you heard definitely differently this time in the reading? or anything that maybe popped out that you'd never really heard in that way or thought of in that way before? Anybody? Rosemary? Go ahead and unmute yourself, yeah. This is the first uh, that I ever knew about Bethany being, um, uh, you know, like um, a different neighborhood, you know, like that. 
I always thought of Bethany being just a little house on the hill or something where, where Mary and Martha and Lazarus right. were out, out of the city. I never thought about it like that. That's very interesting. Um, you know, uh, and I have, I was given to understand one time that Jesus sweat blood. Have you ever heard that one? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, I that, that, and that, that's sometimes the sign of a miracle when people see, you know, statues or stuff that they're saying he's sweating blood. Yeah. Well, I cannot imagine knowing he knew what was going to happen. And, uh, you know, um, uh, I've read about the cruci crucifixion, Roman crucifixion. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it's like people used to say drawing and quartering, and they didn't really mean what that meant. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's a pretty vicious and brutal act, and um, we'll talk about it more when we get to the actual crucifixion, what that actually entails, because I do think we need to understand a little bit. I don't want to get too gory, but just understand what he went through and uh, what the time frame on that would have been. But um, yeah, crucifixion was not a very pleasant way to die. Um, in fact, it was a very torturous way to die. It was actually worth it, worse than a quick death. Um, probably people being crucified had kind of wished they'd maybe just been beheaded or, or stabbed or something, you know, to, uh, to be put out of their misery quickly because it was, a, you know, a very painful and a torturous way to die. And, uh, but it was meant to be so from the Romans. It was meant to teach people a lesson. And, um, you know, that, that was just the handy heaven, ha heavy handedness of Rome. Um, they often did things like that. Um, you know, um, I, I recommend to you guys, if you ever get a chance, uh, I believe it's on either Netflix or Hulu. I'm not sure one. And it kind of came out in uh, kind of short release. But there's a movie called um, Paul, Apostle of Christ that you can walk. And it's about um, Paul being in prison in Rome and his conversations with the Apostle Luke, because Luke and Paul traveled together uh, for a good while. And uh it actually leads up to um, Paul's execution uh, by the Romans, but it's kind of him teaching Luke and giving Luke information to put in his gospel and to, and to share with you know G the, the followers of Christ um, after he was died. But there, there are a couple of scenes in there that are kind of gory about how the Romans took care of people that didn't follow their orders. And one of them was they would put them like in a metal basket and hang them off a pole and set them on fire. And that was the lamppost for the Roman streets where the people that acted up against Rome. And so um, just a vicious, vicious people. And, you know, um, absolutely no honor or no compassion in how they killed people that they wanted, you know, to get rid of. So, um, but don't let that little, that's one short scene. Don't let that offset you. It really is a, a brilliantly done uh, movie. And um, Jim Caviezel, I don't know, do you know who that is? He played Christ in um, Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ. He actually plays the Apostle Luke in this and does a really fabulous job. I didn't recognize the actor that played uh, Paul, but uh, Jim Conviesel did a really standout performance in that, I thought. So, um, very interesting movie. Um, on YouTube. Is it on YouTube? Okay. YouTube. Great, on YouTube as well, yeah. So, um, it's just called Paul, Apostle of Christ, and you can look for Jim Caviezel. That'll tell you. You got the right movie. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but it wasn't a very long movie. I think it was only about an hour and a half, but it was uh, very interesting. So, um, so any other, uh, any other comments about Jesus in the garden, Jesus praying, Cheryl? I just would like to say thank you for explaining about the covenant. I mean, I knew it was a pact, but I didn't understand the whole higher authority versus not so mm -hmm. that was, that's interesting thank you for that okay yeah and you know and i say that because it's important for us to remember that when we when we come into relationship with god we don't really do it out of equality um god is still our father god is still the supreme being and you know we are part of his creation so when, when he deigns himself to make a a promise to us a compact with us um, he is still doing it out of all of his power. 
not out of weakness or not out of, you know, anything that, that we've done. In other words, he doesn't do it because of us. He does it for us and because of his love for us. And so, um, yeah, that, that's kind of an important thing, you know, especially as you read the Old Testament and you come across some of those covenants uh, that happen, you know, with, uh, with some of Jesus' chosen ones. It really kind of helps maybe put that in perspective to realize that that's a, that's a thing where God maybe for a moment put away uh, his, his, his supremacy as a deity to really uh, come in relation one-on-one -on -one with his creation, the human race. Um, and it certainly gives, you know, the Old Testament kind of gets a bad rap of uh, showing, you know, the God of wrath, the God with the thunderbolts and this, that, and the other. But um, really when you read the Old Testament, um, God is really crying out and desirous of relationship with his people of his creation. I mean, that's, that's the whole impetus of the old Testament is God trying to bring them back into relation to him and forgive their sins so they can go back to paradise. Um, really all of the lightning bolts and stuff are the Jewish people themselves <laughs> talking about what they feel like God's doing to them for them, turning their face from him and not following his word. So, um, a lot of it is much more their lamentation about what's happened to them because of their own turning out of the relationship than really anything God has done. And, um, and God even says that, and I'm trying to remember the verse exactly, but he's talking to his people and he says, um, when you're cursed by this, you won't be cursed by me. You'll be cursed by yourselves because you've fallen away from me. You will put yourself in danger, yourself in these things. I'm not the one that's attacking you or causing these bad things you're causing them by falling away from me. So he's not really the, the impetus of the bad things that happen to us. They happen to us because we fall away from him. And so we don't have that close personal relationship with we need for his full guidance and protection. So it's kind of you know, a warning to us to make sure that we're right with God, as they say, um, at all times, so, so that we are in that covenant relationship with him to where he, he guides, guard, and protects us. Okay. Any other thoughts before we move on? Okay, we got a couple little short verses here. I don't know if we'll finish this today or not. We're going to try. Um, so let's go to uh, 47 through 56, uh, the betrayal and arrest of Jesus. Um, so we're still in the garden, and Judas has gotten the higher-ups and he's earned his pieces of silver. Um, who would like to read that 47 through 56? Can I get a reader? Rosemary? And then mute yourself, please. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man, arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Jesus said, greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized him and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Okay, thank you. And on that last line, then all the disciples deserted him and fled. They're not just talking about the 12 there. 
Um, they're talking about all the people that followed Jesus, uh, deserted him. Remember um, this very same crowd that has swords and clubs that has come to arrest Jesus is the same crowd that just five days earlier had palm fronds and was singing Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And look, here comes our Messiah. <laughs> and so in just a, sh a few short days, uh, this group has you know, gone from waving the branch of peace to swinging clubs and swords. How a group can change from calm to riotous overnight, huh? We still see that today, don't we? With a few agitators and a few betrayers, um, the people can really get moved to, to do something other than what their initial uh, what their initial nature is, uh, and so you know we have this. Uh, it's a story that we know well. Um, you know, as far as the kiss goes, uh, this would not really have been uncommon. Uh, it, the way we read this, it kind of sounds like something out of the ordinary. Like you know, ooh, a guy wouldn't kiss another guy. So if I kiss him, you'll know that's who it is. Um, you know, in this culture, it was very uh, just like you know in France and some places in Europe now. It's very common when men greet to hug each other and kiss each other on the cheek, um, you know, uh, just as a sign of friendship. And particularly in Jesus' age, it would have been um, a sign of gratitude for a teacher, for a rabbi. You would kiss that rabbi to show, you know, your, your pleasure in them taking you under their wing and teaching you, uh, you know, the, the New Testament, the Old, the Old Testament and, and the lessons in the Word of God. So... Um, and that's why he says greetings rabbi when he teaches him. Um, and notice that Judas never calls him anything but that. You notice that all the disciples have called him Lord or called him son of man or have called him, even Peter called him Messiah. But Judas has never called him anything but rabbi. So Judas has never really seen him as the son of God or as the Messiah or at least the Messiah that he's looking for. And so, um, so we have that. Um, th there is kind of a weird uh, thing here, I think, just in the order of things. Um, they say at once he came up to Jesus and said, greetings, rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, friend, do what you are here to do. Well, what was Judas there to do? To kiss Jesus to let him know who he was. So Jesus really should have said that before he kissed him. <laughs> when he first saw him, he should have said, Judas, <laughs> do what you came here to do. And then Judas says, Rabbi, and kisses him. So, um, you know, it's really interesting that that's flipped around that way, that Jesus would say that after Judas has already given the sign showing that he's the one to be betrayed, that Judas, you know, that Jesus would then, of course, you know, maybe Jesus isn't talking to Judas. Maybe he's talking to the high priest at this point and telling them, you know, maybe Judas has given him the kiss and slunk off in the, in the back with his 30 pieces of silver. And so it's just the high priest there. But that, it's just an interesting translational thing as we read that, how that, uh, how that kind of comes in. And then we have the sword, uh, you know, where the, uh, the follower of Jesus, we never hear about them having swords in any of the Gospels except for this scene. Do we ever hear any of, the, uh, any of his followers talk about having swords or knives or shields or any kind of weaponry? Nope. You know, they, they have bread and fish and nets and stuff like that, but... They don't really carry swords, but now all of a sudden one of Jesus' followers has a sword. And, and uh, is it Luke that he's named as Peter? That Peter's actually the one that takes the sword out and uh, cuts off the servant's ear. So um, trying to give Peter a little more credit, I think, than he deserved uh, at this point anyway. But so anyway, so um, Jesus very quickly tells his followers, and this is kind of a, a key part of this, that not to fight back over this. Um, Jesus is telling them, I have everything well in hand. Um, I have everything exactly as it should be. This is the path that I'm going down. This is the path that has been set for me. And I'm obediently following that path. Don't fight back. Don't try to save me. Don't try to do anything to change the course of this. Because believe it or not, it's going exactly how it needs to go. And it's going exactly the way I want it to go. So this is once again, Jesus kind of telling his disciples that I am in charge. I, I'm, I'm doing what needs to be done. And, um, you know, he lets them run away at this point, which they should. You know, he wants them to be safe because 
these are going to be the very cornerstones that he builds his church on. So they don't need to be there in the midst of all the slings and arrows while this is go going on, for lack of a better term. And so then, um, you know, all the disciples deserted him and fled that same out there. And, you know, he even asked the question to the crowds, have you come out to arrest me like I'm a bandit? You know, the last four days I've been in Jerusalem at the temple. Uh, I turned over the money changers table and you didn't arrest me. I let loose the doves and stuff and you didn't arrest me. Heck, I even talked back to the Pharisees and stuff and you didn't arrest me. Now all of a sudden you come in the dark of night to the garden and arrest me and, you know, where no one can see. And so he's, he's kind of one more little kind of cut there against them about how they preach one thing and do something else. Because once again, it would have been really unusual for the high priest to do this kind of activity after sunset, particularly on the Passover weekend. And so this is really kind of unusual circumstances. Um, I think we'll take a break there because we're about to, um, to start into the trial of Jesus, Jesus before the high priest and Jesus before Pontius Pilate. And that's maybe um, a, a set of verses that are be be best done together. Uh, so we don't lose out time here. It is uh, 1059 already. Um, so we'll open it back up. Just if there are any questions about where we are, or what's going on, or um, any questions you have about this compared to the other Gospels, um, things you've read in the other Gospels. Anyone? Um, I, just have, I just have a comment about the kiss. Yeah, I, mean, I was always told that it was meant as a sign of honor and, um, you know, submission. And the lesser person approached the more powerful person to give the kiss. And mm -hmm. it was, you know, and but it was ironic that this was really betray. Why did he choose a kiss when he was going to betray him? You know, why didn't he just say that that man? He's him. You know, why didn't he just yeah. talk to him? I, I don't know. But, well, I, I I think with Judas, remember. Um, the disciples don't know this is going on. So Judas was trying to find something that he could do that would be normal for what he would do. That would be assigned to the high priest and those with clubs, but wouldn't be evident to the disciples. And so, and you're right, it was a sign of respect and it was a sign of, of honor to go up to your teacher, to a rabbi, um, as the lesser person, as the student, and give them a kiss on the cheek. And so that would have been, that would have not have been unusual at all for him to do in front of people. And so the other disciples would probably think, well, that's how we greet Jesus too. That's, you know, nothing there. But then, all, <clears throat> excuse me, all of a sudden the clubs and the swords come out and we don't really hear where Judas is from that point. So maybe he did kind of back into the darkness after he did the kiss. And so maybe Jesus is do what you came here to do is for the crowds, not for Judas. You know, Judas has given his signal by doing something, <clears throat> excuse me, completely ordinary, but in doing so, he set up the crowds for who they need to come get and arrest and take back to the high priest. You know, I never thought about that before, but uh, you know, it's not like they had electric light bulbs lighting up the whole area. Right. Uh, if, if they were coming out there, they would have had to have torches. How would they have seen ahead of themselves? So they would have made noise. Oh, one would think a group of people with swords and clubs would definitely make noise. Yeah. Um, they, weren't nin they weren't ninjas after all, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, been, uh, you know, they would have known they were coming. Mm-hmm. I, I guess I never really thought about that before. Yeah, and, and you're right, and these people would have been actually pretty angry um, against Jesus as they're coming out into the garden. Um, one thing we don't really get in Matthew's uh, gospel, but we get it in the other gospel readings, is um, the high priest and, and, and the religious order had kind of told the people, kind of filled them with a lie that um, Jesus was a seditionist, and we need to take care of him before the Romans do, because if the Romans do, there's going to be bloodshed on Passover weekend. And you all are going to get killed. And, and, and you know, so they, they really kind of um, stoked fear among the people about how, um, you know, about how dangerous this Jesus was and that they needed to go get him before he made the Romans turn on, you know, the people. And so 
Uh, yeah, I would think they would have made quite a bit of noise tromping through the gardens with, you know, swords and clubs and, and, and uh, you know, um, torches and stuff. It would have been very easy to see them coming, I would think. But Matthew certainly does it right at that, that way, does he? He makes it seem like they, they kind of sneak up behind the trees and wait for Judas to kiss him, and then they all come running out with their clubs. But um, what we do know is, though, that it was Jesus' plan. It was Jesus' plan that Judas betray him with a kiss. It was Jesus' plan that they come and arrest him uh, to take him to the high priest. So um, they're doing what, what Jesus has foretold them doing and what the plan has been put in place by God. So um, we have to trust in Jesus on that part that, he knew what he was doing and things were going the way he wanted him to go uh, through this ordeal. And when we, you know, when we see that, when we feel that even knowing what was happening, he still went ahead and did it, that he was that obedient to the father's plan and the father's will, um, that should really give us extra pause at how much he loved us in order to do that. It would be one thing if he was just martyred, if they had just arrested him and crucified him. But to know that you're setting up a scenario for that to happen, that you're setting up for yourself to be tried, to be whipped, to be crucified, and doing it to obey your father, that is an amazing amount of love and obedience when we look at that. It really is. I mean, it, it's... It's something that should really rend our hearts, uh, to use a, a right one phrase, you know, uh, to, to rend our hearts toward what Jesus did to us and how willfully disobedient we are through our day for simple things, you know, and not even these big, the big things like what, you know, God asked us to do. So, um, yeah, but Jesus is in charge, and that's what we get from this, that, that he's in control of what's going on, and it's going to be his plan. And um, we know that because, you know, when he ever gets asked by the people, are you the, are you the son of God and this, that, and the other, he doesn't answer. He says, you say that I am, or, you know, puts words in their mouth. So um, he never really, going back, gives them cause for what they did. But he knew that it had to be done anyway. Okay. Other thoughts, comments, suggestions? Nancy? Oh, I just got a text from Karen Conley uh -huh. asking for prayer from everybody. Her husband was very sick last night with 101 temperature. Ooh, okay. And they're waiting to hear back from the doctor. He's in, he's um, a cancer patient. Oh, okay. So, and he just, has, he just had some scans done and she said he had a very bad reaction to the contrast scan. Oh, okay. She's just asking for prayers and to say that that's why she's not on. Okay, and her husband's name is Lee when you're mm -hmm. praying, Lee Conley, if you'd pray for him. Carol? Uh, unmute yourself first and then, yeah. Okay, I just got a text from our friend Richard Bingham, who is on his 13th cancer, terminal cancer diagnosis. He went in expecting bad news today from the surgeon, and after his chemo, the removal of his tongue the tumor has gone down so much less the lymphoma has come into line and once again god has given him a miracle that only the good lord and prayer could have had happened at this point because he was very weak praise be to god prayer prayer helps prayer works wonders yeah it does okay well, um, I thank you all for your time and attention this morning and for um, continuing through this really rather hard part of Matthew's gospel. Um, anytime we talk about the uh, crucifixion and death of our Lord and Savior, it's kind of tough for us, but there are some important things that we can pick up from this. And so we will continue this journey with him uh, next Thursday at 10 o'clock. Uh, so let's go ahead and um, you read 26 this week. Let's go ahead and get into 27 next week if you want to go ahead and read that in preparation. And then um, we might not get through all of 27, but um, yeah, we'll move pretty quickly and we're getting close to the, uh, to the end of Matthew's gospel. Um, to that end, uh, you don't have to answer me today. Maybe think about for next week. 
Um, I'd kind of like to know where you guys would like to go next. Um, we don't have another little book like this, so we can do our own thing uh, or do something that's interesting to y'all. Um, if there's something in particular you've wanted to study, something you've wanted to read, uh, something you've wanted to discuss, um, start thinking about some things like that, um, you know, for Bible study and, and for where we go. Melinda? Uh, when we were having the uh, Lenten series, one of the things you were going to do is go through like the service and explain, you know, go through a service and okay. what you're doing and the meaning of it and everything. I know Cheryl and I both at that time were very interested in seeing that. Okay. That's an idea. So y'all be interested in doing an instructional Eucharist? I think that would be very interesting. Okay. I'll be glad to, and we can uh, record that. So that'll be good. So if anybody else wants to see it and know what I'm doing up there, they can. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was, that was going to be actually the last night of the, um, of the Lenten program was an instructional Eucharist on why we do what we do. Right. So very good. Yeah, I'll be glad to do that. Cheryl? So we just watched the movie, The Overcomer, mm -hmm. made by that church. And um, so she read, he, the teacher had her start in the Bible by reading Ephesians. And I thought it was interesting um, that maybe that was something, someplace we could go also. Okay. Very good. I've always wanted to do Acts of the Apostles. A real okay. You know, and, and that's really important. We tend to spend a lot of our focus on the four Gospels. Mm -hmm. But actually, all four of the Gospels were written after the creation of the early church, which is um, given to us through the Acts of the Apostles and Paul's letters. And that might be a really interesting study for us to do is to look at how the early church formed and the things that the early church faced getting started, uh, which are recorded in Paul's letters to us. So, and that would include Ephesians um, at that time when we do that. So um, maybe we'll, we'll take a break from actual Bible study when we get done with Matthew and do the instructional Eucharist. And that might take one or two sessions. Uh, maybe, maybe I can do it just in one, but um, we'll do that. And then after that, we'll come back and maybe start into Acts where the church was actually formed and then go into Paul's letters. Because um, Paul's letters are usually short. They're usually like four or five page chapters. So um, we could do a letter or two a week and go through them um, pretty quickly and see the themes that are going on there. But That's great. Yeah, remember that Paul wrote first. <laughs> <laughs> Paul was our real first writer, even though he wasn't an apostle or a gospel writer. Uh, Paul wrote first about the church uh, and, you know, was one of the first ones out there before Mark wrote the first gospel. So, um, yeah, that sounds like a good game plan. And I love talking about Paul. I think we get a lot of our, um, a lot of our good fruit of the spirit comes from Paul when we talk about what it means to be a Christian in life, um, rather than going backwards and looking at the historical Jesus, it kind of looks forward as to the kingdom of heaven on earth today and what Jesus wants us to be doing right now. And I think that would be good for us to delve into too. Mm -hmm. All righty. Good. Okay, you. that's a plan. Good. I'm glad we could do that. We probably got another uh, session or two um, with Matthew here, and then from there we'll do the instructional Eucharist and then uh, delve into the early church. Okay, great. All right. Good. Well, thank you all so much. I appreciate your time and attention, and it's so good to see all your faces. And um, take care of yourself. Be careful out there, and God bless. And I'll hopefully see you tonight at uh, evening prayer at six. Amen. Bye. Bye-bye.